Today's webinar is entitled Libraries and Economic Recovery Supporting Entrepreneurs, presented by George Needham and Joan Fry Williams. George's credits include a number of high profile management posts, including State Librarian of Michigan, Executive Director of the Public Library Association, Director of Member Services of the Ohio Library Association, and Library Director of Fairfield County District Library in Lancaster, Ohio. He's also part of the executive team at OCLC, a nonprofit library service and research organization, and the world's largest library consortium. Joan has worked as a successful librarian, consultant, vendor, designer, trainer, and evaluator of library services. She is an internationally recognized library futurist with a special emphasis on innovation and emerging library trends. I'm now happy to introduce George and Joan. Thanks, Eileen, and it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, and I'd just like to say that it's always good to work with info people on these webinars because the music is just so good. So <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, Hi, George. Hi, Joan. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, we're here to do another webinar today, and the topic of economic recovery has been on, on librarians' minds for a long time. Um, but there's been a lot of conversation about people in libraries reaching out and helping their users find jobs. But today we're going to take a different angle on this. We're going to talk about what libraries can do, not just to help people find jobs, but to help people create their own jobs. You know, entrepreneurs aren't some kind of uh, exotic creatures who only exist on Wall Street or in Silicon Valley. There are entrepreneurs all around us. Um, that would include us. Um, you, yep. you know yep. entrepreneurs. We're, we're both entrepreneurs, um, sole proprietors, doing our consulting gigs um, on a freelance basis. Um, we're the market for the kinds of services libraries can provide. Um, don't worry, we're not going to be talking today just about our personal uh, pet peeves or our needs, but we, we can speak from personal experience about the kinds of needs that cross the spectrum of entrepreneurs, the, the people who are doing their work uh, on a freelance basis. You know, there's a, a lot of reasons for the rise of what we call independent workers in the modern economy today. First, there's that ability to work from anywhere. As anybody who's you know, brought along a, a laptop or a tablet or a smartphone on vacation has discovered, you can work from anywhere. As, uh, in our case, if you're close enough to an airport that you can jump on a plane fairly easily, you can pretty much live and work wherever you want to be. There's also the changing relationship between employers and employees. It seems to, that there's less loyalty and there's less permanence in either direction in the, in the uh, employee relationship. There's also fewer workers in collective bargaining relationships with their employers, which means that jobs are more tenuous than they were in other times. And finally, the, the whole uh, uh, trend that we're seeing toward shrinking government has destroyed the concept of government work being lifetime employment. So basically, some people are entrepreneurs by choice. It's a, a choice they make about the way they like to work. But more and more lately, others have had entrepreneurship trust, uh, thrust upon them. Um, maybe they have tried to look for uh, regular employment and are falling back to self-employment as the only thing that, that's available for them. Maybe they've had it. They've worked a, almost a full career. They have a few more left, years left before retirement, and they've got, had a dream that they'd like to try something. Now's their chance. However they arrive there, the pendulum is, is swinging back, and we're seeing more and more independent workers or people who would like to be independent workers, um, what's being called the free agent nation. Um, and that's not something that's totally new. I, I think it's more of a return mm -hmm. to a free 20th century model of, of work style, people creating and being responsible for their own work. And this isn't just about people who are out to control all the patents on cell phone technology or who are trying to corner the market in pork bellies or who want to become the next generation of robber barons. You know, there are also a lot of social entrepreneurs, people who apply the techniques and the style of entrepreneurship to social issues. They have similar needs, but they, but they have different motives. And if you want to find out more about this approach, there's a, an interesting article in this month's issue of the Harvard Business Review called The Four Benefit Enterprise by Hirad Sebeti. There's a link to this article and to the other sources that we're going to be citing throughout the webinar this afternoon, uh, and it will be posted on the Info People site following today's webinar. 
And there's another distinction I think is important to make, not just between for-profit and social entrepreneurs, um, and that's between entrepreneurs and small business. Many entrepreneurs reject the idea of becoming the robber barons. Um, they reject the idea of becoming traditional business people at all. Um, we're looking at people like graphic artists, chefs, consultants, writers, designers, um, crafters, musicians, people who are developing cell phone apps, a, a group that has been called in some of the literature um, the new creatives. And their ideas of success do not necessarily align well with traditional business thinking. They are not necessarily going to be doing the small business things that we've thought about in the past. They may not be looking for loans. They may not be building office centers or finding um, you know, special office space. They may not ultimately employ other people. Um, their, their goals are not to start small and grow larger. Their goals are more around flexibility, personal lifestyle, balance with other interests, et cetera. So there's a lot of information and, and a fair number of library programs out there for traditional small businesses. But there's much less that's been created specifically for the sole proprietor, the, the new creative class individual. So we're thinking nowadays, and particularly focused in this interview uh, or in this webinar, about um, individual creative micro businesses you know we were asked when we were setting this up why would you want to target this group what what, what makes this group special is this some other group that has a special claim on our time and our attention but um, we think that you should care about these uh, this group just because these are residents of the communities we're serving and to tell the truth that should be enough but if you need a little more convincing um, there's a lot of evidence that this is a, an emerging group that is strengthening local economies, and we know we all need that. We also know that we need to improve the tax base. Even if they don't employ anyone else, they do add to the tax base for income, sales, use, and property taxes. There's also a political element here. Um, elected officials on both sides of the aisle and the appointed uh, planning and economic development officials at all levels are very interested in this new creative class. Um, this, is, this is one of those areas that transcends uh, party affiliation. Everybody can, can support. And it, it does something else. It, it contributes um, to the notion that libraries are not just about the past. Um, our participation in economic growth and our support for people who are trying to create a new future for our communities really cast the library in a, in a different kind of light. That's true. This, is, uh, this particular picture is Illinois State Representative David Harris, who was visiting the newly expanded business center at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library just outside of Chicago on July 12th this year. Arlington Heights Memorial Library has a great business center, and Shannon Scanlon, who runs the business center, has done great work with the business community in, her, uh, in Arlington Heights. It's a model of what public libraries could do in this area. Um, and for, for, just on the purposes of full disclosure, Arlington Heights Memorial Library is one of the clients of uh, George and Joan. So. Now, there's another reason here, and that is that Working with entrepreneurs cultivates a new audience, a developing subgroup, a growth area, in other words, for libraries. We also need to consider that the impact that entrepreneurs can have on the neighborhoods and the cities in which they reside. Um, like artists in earlier decades, entrepreneurs can help rebuild failing neighborhoods, and they can help change people's images of these communities. We've made a, a point in other webinars and in some of the presentations that we've done over the years that part of library sustainability is about increasing services and expanding markets while we downshift services that seem to be dwindling around us uh, where there's less and less demand. This is, this is an area of growth for libraries, and the chart that you see on the slide here is a relevance chart, not a workload indicator. And uh, dare I say it, um, focusing more on this group might mean focusing less on some areas where the demand is declining. Yeah, I think it's an important um, point to make that we're not talking about just necessarily adding this on top of everything you're already responsible for, but considering whether targeting 
uh, this audience, which is growing and is very vibrant and promising, might be more effective for you as a strategy and more important for your community than targeting some of the traditional audiences that are well-established or have less demand. These are generally new library users. These are people who haven't necessarily been closely connected with the library, um, which cuts both ways. First of all, we have to create a relationship, a new relationship, but it also creates a whole new cadre of allies and advocates, people who understand um, the value that we bring. Now, I'm not saying that the only reason we should serve somebody is that they'll go out and be a good spokesperson for us, but uh, one thing about communicating with this group is it takes us into new parts of the community that's not the same old faces. And frankly, the, doing this demonstrates uh, a real literal economic return on the investment in our libraries. Um, if, if we reach out to entrepreneurs, we're demonstrating to the community that we're using their investment in the library wisely and that we're, we're giving back, if you will, uh, in ways that, that have a kind of a multiplier effect. Investing in the library actually is literally paying off. So we believe that libraries and entrepreneurs are a good match for several important reasons. But it's not a given. Like Joan said, many of these folks have not used libraries in years, if ever, and they're, they're not going to just naturally gravitate towards the library. So like anything else that's worth building, this relationship between the libraries and the entrepreneurs is going to take some time and effort to create. And here's a challenge, and, and th for this one, maybe I can speak from my own experience, uh, where there's a real contrast between the entrepreneur sort of lifestyle and what people think librarians and libraries are like. We have a stereotype to overcome. Entrepreneurs are frequently drawn to entrepreneurship because they're the kind of people who color outside the lines. Uh, many entrepreneurs, myself included, became entrepreneurs precisely because they have some issues with authority or they don't really like being closely supervised or they, they're impatient with the pace of larger organizations. Now this poses a very special challenge um, because the library has an image that is very authority and supervision and moderate pace oriented. Um, you know, we have an image of being rule-based, of being very strict, of being focused on getting the right answer. Uh, you know, we don't improvise, we don't create. Um, that's the image. I'm not sure that's the truth, but that is what people think of us. So we, we need to make a special effort. Um, you know, if we've got defiantly individualistic people out there who could use our services, we're going to have to show them. We can't just tell them that we can accommodate individualism, that we can improvise. And um, this could require a fair amount of convincing and through demonstration, not, not just through words. Maybe we should just have them watch a, uh, a children's librarian handle 22 four-year-olds the story time, and they get some idea of how we can improvise. Unfortunately, what? those tend not to be the ones who work with the entrepreneurs. Exactly. So. <laughs> you know, it, this is really a relationship that's based on a, on a style of service. The entrepreneurs need to know you as a person, not just as, as an institution or even just as the face of the institution. Anonymity just isn't going to work here. Confidentiality, don't get me wrong, confidentiality is still vital. But you need to participate in their world. You need to be on committees. You need to attend events. You need to celebrate grand openings like this one in the picture. This is a situation where you really have to take and make that personal call. This is also true in the virtual world. Uh, the entrepreneurs linked to the library website should identify a person at the library that they'll be dealing with. Uh, they're, they're really all about people, not institutions. And the library needs to have that kind of humanity uh, as its human face and not just um, a way of wrapping up the institution in a, some kind of a, a, a fungible sort of sense that anybody who anybody you see in the library when you walk in is the person who can help you. So here's one of the biggest differences between providing support to business and providing support to entrepreneurs. You are not going to spend your time answering business questions. You're going to spend your time establishing personal contacts. This works when it's a relationship-based business, and these people are your clients. This is mm -hmm. not about having a particular kind, only about having a particular kind of information and saying, well, if anybody comes in and asks me a business question, I'm ready. That, that's not how this works. You have to reach out. Um, 
There are ways to do that. Uh, most jurisdictions, you can get access to lists of new businesses, people who've taken out new business licenses in your community, and to reach out to them, send them information, introduce yourself, send them information about the service, very useful. Um, joining the Chamber of Commerce. Not everybody does this, but in some smaller communities, it's very common for a, a new entrepreneur to hook into the Chamber. Um, another thing you could do is kind of get ahead of the curve, a curve and, and hook up with students who are in business education programs, particularly in community colleges. Um, Four-year colleges and universities do turn out entrepreneurs, but, but the business programs in community colleges in particular um, generate a lot of, of interest with the, the one-person, solo, new creative type uh, entrepreneur. Um, you know, if, if there's only one academic library you could uh, connect with or only one academic community to reach out to, pick the community college. That's where adults who are thinking about this path go to learn the basics. They, they say, well, I really need to check into accounting and make sure I could handle my books right, or I really want to understand more about marketing. And they may not take a complete degree. It's more likely they'll sample a program. So you might get a chance to co-present with an instructor in this area, or you might get a chance to just apply uh, you know, to the course yourself, sit in and, and share with some of the folks. You can begin to build relationships even before the person knows that he or she is sure they're going to be an entrepreneur. Yep. You know, I was just thinking, too, one of the things that happens with the community colleges, and if you're worried that this is all too she-she or too, uh, you know, too touchy-feely, you're also going to meet a lot of people who are going to become entrepreneurs in the trades here, and they're also very vital to your community's well-being. So this is also an, op an opportunity to meet entrepreneurs who are going to be opening um, plumbing shops and who are going to be electricians and who are going to be doing other work as well. Exactly. Entrepreneurs frequently do work alone, but they aren't necessarily loners by choice. So for business as well as for social reasons, they also need to network. And this is something that you can support in your role of librarian as convener. So what, what sorts of things can you offer? Well, you can do mixers where you just you know bring people in, have a, uh, uh, an opportunity for people to meet one another, maybe have some punch and cookies, whatever, uh, as a mixer. You, want, uh, you might even consider, and I'm just throwing this out there, you might even consider having a wine and cheese reception. It's something that uh, you know art museums and other public institutions do all the time, but we tend to kind of shy away from. And I think that if you, you serve alcohol only if you really want to grab a crowd. Um, <laughs> you also can do events around specific topics. So maybe it's uh, something on tax time, or maybe it's something on other kinds of issues that would uh, attract a cross-section of your entrepreneurial community and give them a chance to, to network and talk. And this can be formal or it can be informal. You can say, you, you can have specific events with speakers and uh, other kinds of formal programs, or it can be much less formal. Or it could be just say, you know, um, apps writers, come on in on uh, Sunday afternoon and you know, we'll, we'll have a, a table devoted to discussing issues that you're facing with the new release of Android or, or other things like that. Once you actually manage to meet some of these folks, part of what you need to do is to ask the right questions. Um, and we've said this in other venues, with any service you want to offer, you need to understand what the customers need from their point of view. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of libraries go into service to the business community by saying, well, let us tell you all about us, and not so much. We think you ought to spend less time telling entrepreneurs about the library and, and more time asking about them and about their needs and about what they're trying to accomplish. And demonstrating a willingness to understand the world from their point of view is a huge part of making a successful connection. So we're suggesting that um, the librarians who want to pursue this don't work on an elevator speech, that they work on elevator questions. What mm -hmm. am I going to ask people when I get a chance to meet them? Um, I like what Douglas County Library in Colorado has been doing with their, what they call them, community reference questions. And it's three very basic reference questions. The first question is, what challenges are you facing? You know, sort of basically, what, 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 is keeping you up at night. What are you working on? What what challenges are you facing? And then the second question is, what do you wish you knew more about as you work on that? 
not here let me tell you all about my databases but that mm-hmm. that's the, the killer question what do you wish you knew more about as you work on the thing you just told me was an important issue for you and then the third question um director jamie larue has his reference librarians ask when they're out in the community is who else should we be talking to um, so that they can continue to network and continue to touch the people who really need their services. Now, this is still classic reference, but it's shaped in a way that focuses on the user and the user's needs and gets out of the building to go find them where they are and offer service in that way. It's uh, interesting in the chat room, a couple of people are getting a little ahead of us in our, our discussion today in terms of uh, new partnerships, but we'll touch on that uh, in a few minutes. No, I think this is great. Any place that you can be where these folks might gather, make that connection, get to know them. It's all good. Um, and and, and is, to create the venue where it does happen, which is yeah, what uh, one of the Rosalind assets, and Jennifer were saying. Yeah, one of the assets we can leverage is we've got space, and people know mm-hmm. where it is. We've got parking. It's all good. Um, another thing librarians can do that I think we, we don't always remember to, to highlight is, is we can demonstrate that we have really local knowledge. Um, that, that we know what's going on around here, ha- what's happening local, who's who in the community, what sorts of businesses are already operating, who the key players are. And one of the things that, that you can do to prepare to serve this group is to create kind of a community profile from a business perspective. And just have that in your hip pocket. Keep it up to date. Know who's who. If somebody says they're interested in the chamber, do you know who's in charge of the chamber? Who are the people? What are their phone numbers? What do they care about? The hardest thing an entrepreneur can do, especially starting out, is make a cold call. Mm -hmm. To email or call somebody that they don't know and try to make something happen. If you know the right person's name and what the deal is and can kind of broker that connection, you are golden. And mm-hmm. inside knowledge of this type is, generally speaking, more valuable to an entrepreneur than what a librarian would consider expert or authoritative knowledge. Um, it makes you more credible to this audience, and it's, it's just more pragmatic. It feels more useful. And speaking of pra- pragmatic and useful, workspaces really need to evolve to be more useful for entrepreneurs. And they'll need both formal and informal working spaces. The right type of space can inspire creativity and collaboration. It can bring people together in ways they might not have thought of before. Tables, just a plain table where people can share ideas and work with a common focus and work on common materials can engender this sort of inspiration. There's also a need for private meeting and conversation space where entrepreneurs can meet with their clients. You know, uh, not everyone is comfortable with clients tromping through their living rooms. And so these folks actually need a space to meet and to connect. A table in a quiet corner is often everything that's needed to meet this need. And uh, there's one other thing that we saw at the Arlington Heights Library that we were really impressed with. And that was that uh, Shannon had recognized that one of the issues that they had was that there were people who were unemployed who had never told their families they were unemployed. And they just needed a place to hang out during the day. Uh, Not – they're they're looking for work. They're reading the business materials. They're staying on top of what's going on. But they're also – they, they just need a place to be. And one of the things that they've done there is they've got a TV set that's always on, but it's set to mute, and it carries either Bloomberg or CNBC or something else that would be relevant to people who are uh, trying to get back into the business world or who were entrepreneurs. And this is a, a place where uh, it's the welcome that's really mm-hmm. important. You know, how, right. how do we make people know this is their space? Not that it's exclusive to them necessarily, but that they're welcome. And to create uh, even a small business-friendly, yes-you-belong-here expression um, is what we want to do. Mm-hmm. The other thing, and this, this of course, is, is you know at the heart of what we always think about when we're talking about serving a new target audience is build collections. And the key here is to build collections that are truly accessible and in both senses, easy to get to and easy to understand. Um, you get a lot of points, again, in this category for pragmatism. The collections this audience needs are not about business topics as much as business activities, what they do. And, and if, if you want to attest, just tell me sort of how something is or what the theory of it is or how it works. or that, That's not what we're talking about. It's like, tell me what I'm supposed to do. 
and mm-hmm. tell me who's done that and had it work. We we want to do what um, Pine and Gilmore call ing the thing. You know, let me let me look at the verb here, not the noun. And and this is another big departure from traditional small business materials. Um, you look at things that target small business, and including a lot of the stuff that comes from the Small Business Administration. Um, they're intended for people who are are needing to do um, business plans, uh, you know, to to create uh, uh, a vision for the future. And the entrepreneurs are going, how do I do this today? <laughs> they're they're very um, now focused. They're they're looking for things like competitive intelligence. They're trying to solve legal problems. They're very big on needing to find forms for various things. Um, and and you may want to create like. Uh, packages that say for this, you know, set of forms, here's what you do, and here are two or three articles about how people do it. Um, they need tax information. They do need databases, um, and there's a lot of information of use to them in resources like Reference USA. Um, but most of their work is around solving an immediate problem, not around taking a longer view or understanding the, the background or the theory of something. Another real key for this group is whatever you're putting out there, um, if it can be available 24-7, all to the good. And the mm-hmm. extent to which you can put this stuff online, um, entrepreneurs don't punch a clock generally. And some people are balancing family responsibilities or school responsibilities or part-time day job responsibilities with their entrepreneurial activity. So collections that are biased toward e-versions of this information um, may really be a good choice here, but they do have to be packaged to be easily understood. Just making the tax forms available uh, online, but not having any support about how to use them or what to do, um, doesn't quite meet the group where they need to be. So we've talked about some of those accessible collections, and, and what kind of a environment do we need to offer to make them usable and how do we support them in this well the first thing you've got to have is free wireless with high bandwidth people need that kind they, that gives them a reason to be in the library other than being at home because generally we can provide higher bandwidth we can provide more options on that both with within the computers that we offer and the ones that they bring from home uh, the, speaking of the, the computers that we offer, time limitations can really be an issue for these folks. If they're trying to respond to an RFP or if they're trying to fill out forms uh, that are necessary to become bidders on projects, they may not be able to shoehorn that into the half hour that you may be allowing for people on the PCs. You, there may be uh, a need to find out other ways that you can uh, offer this uh, service with, with more time. They need ways to be on the phone and to be online simultaneously. And, you know, if you've got a uh, the, the wrong kind of hookup at home, you can't do that at home. Uh, we also offer software programs that a lot of people can't afford or don't have access to. Things like desktop publishing, they can be really expensive, but really help when you're trying to set up a brochure or just the other ways to describe your services. But there's one caveat here. We can't just offer the technology. We have to be willing to sit down with people and actually help them get started using it. Does that mean we have to tutor them all the way, hold their hand from beginning to end? Maybe yes. Maybe it's worth it in this case. But we definitely at least have to be able to get them started and get them up and running. You know, and and this is one where I'm going to share just a little of my personal experience. I have a fairly nicely equipped home office. I've got really great bandwidth, giant monitor, good printer. You know, I I got a lot of stuff. I've been running a, a business out of this space for a long time. But periodically, you know, an architect I'm working with on a project sends me something that needs to be printed on a bigger format printer than I have. Or somebody Mm -hmm. sends me a project management document in a project management software package that I don't have and for which I can't find a reader. And there I am. I've got a document. I know I need to look at it. It's in my email. And I don't know how to get that baby open. And there are situations where even someone who's doing well with the home office space needs the occasional extra, you know, feature, and to have that available for an entire community is a cost-effective way to provide it. It is not the kind of thing that an individual is going to buy for himself to open one one document. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's another kind of a situation, too, that if you have something that is, uh, you know, needs to be done in real time, like watch a webinar, listen to a webinar, um, it is hard sometimes to find a space where you can actually set up and do that just for the hour it takes. 
Um, I think that equipping some of our small room meeting spaces with equipment that can be used for things like webinars on an appointment basis is another way to support entrepreneurial use. So it, one of the differences, I think, between uh, the way you work with entrepreneurs and the way you work in standard library work is that you have to think of it as research not just reference. It's not just about providing the information. And one of the biggest issues is saving the entrepreneur's time. Their time really is money. Um, and taking appointments so that you can work with somebody and focus on their question can be extraordinarily um, useful and desirable. I thought it was interesting because I was just doing a Q&A with somebody here who was talking about the fact that they'd love to be able to offer longer computer times for people, but they just have too much demand. And that's one of the things I suggest was take appointments. So maybe during the less busy times of the day, during the, the school hours perhaps, you could offer a longer time if somebody made an appointment ahead of time. Um, we've seen this over and over again that saving people's time is actually more valuable to them even than saving a little bit of money. Um, I, we had a speaker at an OCLC program a couple of years ago who talked about all, uh, all of the gyrations she had to go through to get onto the computer system. I'm sorry, yeah, to get into the computer system for the library in her community, and. When she finally got on, she discovered a wealth of information she really needed to run her business. Unfortunately, she said, most business people don't have the amount of time to invest in getting to that stuff that she had specifically because she knew she was going to talk to a library audience. And, you know, it's, it's one of those deals where, of all the groups you're serving, um, this is the group where time is going to be the crunch. Um, they're accustomed to accounting for their time very closely. Um, if you save them time, you're a hero. If you cost them time, you really will never see them again. Um, and they will tell everybody you cost them time and money. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I see, in, again, in the Q&A, you know, say, well, we, don't, we need more computers. We know we need more computers, but we don't have money to buy them. And then at some point, we're going to have to figure out how to designate something or not buy something else in order to get the resources that are needed. I know this is not a good time to be talking about buying anything in a library, but we have clients who still buy a lot of materials that are not heavily used and then ration the services that are heavily used. And this may be time to say, okay, are we really, really doing our full mission to the community by buying more in the 800s or should we take some of that scarce resource and buy something that has a line waiting to use it? And I, you know, that's a tough call. It's I don't mean to oversimplify, but it, it's something we have to think about. Absolutely. Um, there's another program I think that speaks to this time issue, and that's something again Douglas County is doing. They call it economic gardening. I like that that notion. It's a great economic phrase, gardening. Yeah. This is a program they've designed to help entrepreneurs thrive by connecting them. Again, the library is the, the glue in the community. Connecting the entrepreneurs to information and particularly to expertise that they might not be aware of or that they otherwise might find it difficult to find or engage. So the, the economic gardening program connects entrepreneurs to individuals, to librarians who work with them over a period of time, and to other community individuals who have expertise or our gatekeepers for important services. Um, it's another example of the library kind of as convener, rather than knowing all the subject information yourself, you're the, the person who, who hooks somebody to something else. Um, this is another example also of embedding librarians in the community and saying, I'm out here working with you and connecting you to what you need to be connected with, rather than you're having to take the time to come to where I am. This one is, a, is sort of a, maybe this is extra credit, but I think it could really get you far working with the entrepreneurs group. A lot of entrepreneurs are trying to do something new. And the library's image is not necessarily around innovation. People don't give us credit for how at the forefront we really are in some areas. We can highlight the innovative spirit in our community in a number of ways. Um, one is that hosting community conversations. Um, I think most of you are familiar with TED Talks, and some talks speak very much to how people can 
uh, do interesting new things in their communities. This is a special appeal to um, social entrepreneurs often. So showing the TED Talks, having conversations about those. Um, in California, we have something called Summer of Smart. Summer of Smart is a, a kind of a three-month experiment in urban innovation. So over the course of the summer, um, people from different disciplines, developers, designers, planners, community activists get together to talk about the issues facing their city. And then they develop projects around what could smart people do um, to, to uh, tackle these challenges. And economic development and creating an entrepreneur-friendly environment in a city is, has been a topic of Summer of Smart. Um, it's a, a way to create dialogue around, around new things and potential to create change. Even something as simple as the technology petting zoo demonstrates uh, where libraries really are on, on the scale of, of innovation. It, it's um, important, again, to not just to overcome the stereotype, but to help people think about the, the next new thing. We spoke earlier about making people feel welcome, demonstrating a, a, a hospitality. Uh, this is a part of the George and Joan canon. We talk about this a lot. But it is every bit as true here as it is in general library service. Everyone should be able to do the intercept for entrepreneurs and start the con start the connections going. Again, as I said earlier, not everybody is, is going to be a reference librarian. It's not that fungible, but everyone, director and shelver alike, should know how to get a customer started and how to get them to the right person to provide in-depth assistance. You don't want people to feel like they're being given the runaround or that they're being given the brush up. Uh, it's, they're both annoying and time wasting if you're if uh, if you're not getting to the right person. Everybody should be able to at least get folks started and get them uh, hooked up with the right person within the library who can give them that long-term help. And I'm, I'm just going to be blunt here. Library workers have not always demonstrated a welcome for business people or business activity. Mm -hmm. um, in some places, there's kind of a contempt for business. <laughs> and I even see now kind of a rivalry that says, gosh, you know, if we're a publicly funded agency and, and we're not getting funded and we're not getting raises and we're not getting benefits and everybody's saying that the private sector does a better job than the public sector, there's this almost like sibling rivalry going on. And, and that, that is not the way to, to serve this group. Um, there's a big question here. And, and I think it's, it's worth just saying out loud, do you actually believe that it's okay for entrepreneurs to do what they do and to do it in library space for business purposes? Is it all right to make a profit in combination with the library? And you know, I think there's a little irony here too because I, I, you know, I make my profit by working with libraries and it is in fact public money that channels to the private sector when somebody hires me. But it, because I'm a, a library person, people don't always think of it that way. But we've seen some more than one library that, that really considers it a problem that somebody would make money by using library resources. Um, there are mo there's more than one library that, that has made it a policy that an individual entrepreneur, somebody like an academic tutor or a college recruiter or a financial advisor or a real estate agent, somebody like that, would not be permitted to conduct their business in the library unless they register with the reference desk and pay a fee for a table pass. <laughs> um, the this library, is about the time when yeah, this is about yeah. the time when we start talking about getting out the sugar to put in the gas tank. There you go. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, so anyway. We know about a library that charges a fee to use the library if you're going to use it for any business related purpose and they also limit business related library use to the hours of five to seven PM. <sighs> And this is a matter of policy because they say, well, no, the library is here for non-profit use, and any profit-related usage is not appropriate. And I, I, you know, George and I kind of scratch our heads and say, well, A, these people either pay taxes now in the community or they sure wish they could pay more if they were working more. And mm -hmm. B, what is it that makes uh, the desire to earn a living somehow turn you into an evil parasite when the desire to, you know, find a cookbook doesn't. I, I, somehow there's a fundamental uh, resentment of or mistrust for or rivalry with business that does creep into libraries sometimes as much as these overt policies. And if, 
you think you ought to be supporting entrepreneurs, but the frontline people in your organization don't don't uh, think that's appropriate. It's not only a matter of training everyone as a first responder, but making a clear matter of policy of whether these entrepreneurs are welcome or not. Um, if if the general culture of the library is that when an entrepreneur uses a resource, they're taking it from more deserving people, um, then we got a different kind of problem. Yeah, I think that's that's, that's very true. The um, so how can you become more entrepreneur friendly? Well, one way to do this is to plan for some of the predictable situations that entrepreneurs are going to face. There are a number of areas where we know libraries can help entrepreneurs, and you don't really need to wait for a specific reference question to come in in order to get ready to provide some assistance. Every entrepreneur who's just setting out needs to address some basics, and I can certainly attest to this uh, as somebody who has been uh, just trying to set out myself in my own business here. There are some basic things you need to know. First, you have to establish yourself as a business entity. And that's everything from figuring out what to call call yourself as a business to getting a license to setting up a separate checking account and even printing stationery. Now, there's, there's lots of checklists out there. So gathering some of these into an online kit and keeping it up to date with current links is a simple and useful service. The next thing you have to do is define your product. Well, what business specifically are you going to be in? What do you have to offer? What's the big idea? What, why you and not somebody else? Now, not every solo entrepreneur needs a full-blown business plan, but uh, some of the business plan resources that you have on hand do give some really good advice about how to define and differentiate your product. And finally, you need to define your market. Who else is doing what you do? Um, who else is in your field? Where are they? And so libraries can help with the demographic data that people need through things like uh, census records, American Fact Finder, things like that, as well as maps and other kinds of community profiles that we talked about earlier. Once you're getting started, the next thing you want to do is size up the competition. And there are good resources for this. The Manufacturing and Trade Associations have a lot of material. Um, don't overlook the local and regional economic development offices. They frequently have very... Uh, regionalized specific to your area. Um, entrepreneurs who, who do contracting with um, government agencies often look at the SIC codes, the standard industrial classifications material, and the uh, uh, NAICS, North American Industrial Classification System statistics. Those are useful. Um, ThomasNet, if you've seen that, has a lot of uh, information on industrial suppliers. And then, of course, there are the databases that are specific to their various areas of interest. Um, they need to keep up with what's happening in their industry. They need to know the trends, but they're particularly interested in articles uh, that speak to specific practices. Now, we've talked a lot about chambers of commerce, and I will point out that most chambers of commerce have a no-compete policy, and that competitive information is one area where they don't help an entrepreneur. They try really hard. They bend over backwards not to help people size up the competition. So if, if um, you're thinking that other folks are going to handle this, there is a little vacuum here. There's a gap that the library can step into, not because somebody couldn't find this if they were really dedicated on their own, but it's hard to package. Packaging competitive information by type of business, competitive information for designers, competitive information for chefs, um, if you find you have certain types of entrepreneurs that, that like to work in your community, competitive information for artists um, can be really, really a helpful resource, just pulling together what's already out there. You know, coming up with the idea of how you're going to price the product is also a really difficult situation for a brand new entrepreneur. Uh, it's even more difficult if, uh, if that entrepreneur is offering something unique where there are no benchmarks or comparison shopping possibilities. You know, there, there are books, there's online courses, there's seminars, there's magazine articles galore about how to determine the right price for what you're offering. But the truth is, the best way to price your service or product is to talk to established practitioners. And these practitioners are often very willing to help newbies. Uh, and I tip my hat here to Ms. Fry Williams for helping me again, getting started in my own business. But the library can be the place where these conversations can happen. And in fact, I think one of our first took place in the Sunnyvale Library. Uh, and these sometimes, like for us, these happen spontaneously. Other times, they happen in very specific planned programs. 
an unpredictable situation. <laughs> Everybody knows, of course, that taxes are, are you know totally predictable, but business taxes happen four times a year. Um, so if you're brand, starting off and you're self-employed and you don't want any big surprises, you need to understand <laughs> the whole deal about estimated taxes. Oh, and yeah. That was a surprise. Just a reminder on your website or in your business communications, like don't forget estimated taxes due on September 15th um, is part of the service showing that you're aware of what they're facing. Entrepreneurs may also have a great idea, but in some cases they don't have a clue about how or if they can protect that idea. You might get questions about the differences among patents, trademarks, copyrights. Uh, you might get questions about when to use Creative Commons protection. Or you might get questions about what can and what can't be protected, like software or recipes or titles or ideas or processes. Now, please get, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that you need to render legal advice to entrepreneurs. But we do think that it's uh, necessary to prepare some resources to assist when these types of typical questions come up. Now, this is one of the kind of predictable situations that really inspire um, collaboration, specifically with law libraries. If you're an academic library, this could be your campus law library. But if you're in an institution that doesn't have its own law school, you might want to collaborate with the public law libraries, which exist in each county in California, as well as in many other states as well. As we were preparing for this webinar at the California Library Association conference last week, uh, we happened to run into Melinda Muller, who's the Director of Programs and Partnerships at the LA Law Library, and we got into quite an interesting conversation about ways that um, law libraries and other types of libraries could work together. And I'm posting her email address, with her permission, to the chat box right now, so that uh, if you're interested, you can contact her for some ideas about that. Another predictable situation for entrepreneurs is getting started communicating with their customers and with their prospective customers. They need help with three kinds of things. They need help trying to figure out where to communicate to reach their market, where, where their customers are likely to be already. They need help figuring out what to communicate, defining their message, describing what they have to offer, soliciting customer feedback. And this is one of those deals where they are very – anxious to have somebody smart with good you know, uh, proofreading skills look at a communication. One of the things you have to figure out is whether you're going to do that for somebody. Will you look at their message and say, yeah, this is good, but you've got to type over here, or this verb needs to agree with that subject? If not, can you put them in touch with somebody who will? And then they need help with technique, with how to communicate in various channels. You have a lot of uh, library expertise about how to use Twitter, how to use uh, something like Facebook, and is that something you're going to coach people on? It's a perfect opportunity to, to leverage the library's knowledge of, of social networking. We talked a little bit earlier about programming, but it's really important that programming that you offer for entrepreneurs be very much based in reality and in problem solving, not around theory. You want to structure around the outcome that they are hoping for and then bring in the resources that can help bring about those outcomes. You want to be specific about your, what you're offering and don't try to cover everything at once. Yeah, you know, the, the, the first time entrepreneur's guide to the universe is probably not going to help anybody as much as how to get a business license or how to deal with uh, estimated taxes. Think of it as a short attention span program, and I think you'd be on the right track. <laughs> Uh, you don't need to base programs around experts, quote-unquote. The most useful resource for an, intro, an entrepreneur may frequently be another entrepreneur who's already done something they've they're thinking about trying themselves and lived. And uh, just a clue, lunchtime is often a good time to program for this crowd. Brown bag sessions where you provide the beverage and they bring their own lunches can be really attractive to this group. So we're talking about doing lots of different things for entrepreneurs. We're also suggesting that you don't have to do this alone. The, the library really can convene rather than create their programs by working with other community groups that are interested in this target audience. And I, there are a couple of examples I think um, illustrate this point. One would be to partner with what are emerging as co-working spaces. These are shared workspaces, sort of the business incubators, but for one-person businesses. And they seem especially interesting to younger entrepreneurs. Um, one of the examples I like is called The Hub. It's in Melbourne in Australia. Um, and uh, if you're interested in co-working per se, 
Um, on December 1st, there's going to be uh, uh, another webinar. Uh, Meg Gerritsen Nodal, who moonlights as a co working center librarian, is going to be doing an ALA edition online workshop on this topic um, called Making Space for Entrepreneurs and Independent Workers. Um, that's a, a fee based uh, webinar and it costs us $50. But this is somebody who actually is the librarian to one of these co working spaces as a moonlight job and can talk about the new kinds of things that are happening in these environments. Um, I think another example of a great partnership is the University of Kentucky Libraries. Um, they're partnering with the Kentucky Small Business Development Center and something called the Advanced Science and Technology Commercialization Center. And their task is to help entrepreneurs figure out if their new tech ideas actually show promise for commercial use. So the library is helping the folks who have a good tech idea hook up to the people who can help them see where it fits in the market, see where it fits in the technology, and commercialize it, um, get the money to do the prototypes. The University of Kentucky was doing this for their own faculty and realized that there were lots of people in the community who could use this service. Not everybody who's developing apps is, is uh, on faculty in a college. And a third example I'll share is the Johnson County Library in Kansas. Um, for the past five years, they've been working with other government agencies and with nonprofits to host something that's called GovFest, G-O-V-F-E-S-T. And that is more than 50 exhibitors and, uh, from all types of organizations who offer um, information and then classes, things like um, how to compete for government contracts. Um, in past years, they've been doing this for about five years, it's held at the library, but the library is not the formal sponsor. They are the host of something that's done by the whole county. Um, they get you know 400 plus participants. They run a long time. They start at 10 in the morning and they go to 8:30 at night. Be again, Ooh. because <laughs> well, it's a it, a it's kind of a festival, and b yeah. this group doesn't you know necessarily make a two-hour window for an event. Um, mm -hmm. so they go from from 10 to 8:30. It is totally free, and this is very important for this group. You don't have to register in advance. It's Ooh, a drop-in program, yeah. and so somebody who not sure they're going to go or doesn't have to sign up, I, you know, they open the doors to people and they give them stuff they're interested in. They keep them open for a long time, and a lot of people show up. And that degree of flexibility and improv and that sort of faith that if you build it, they will come really characterizes reaching out to this group. If you made people sign up for this, there's no way they'd get 400. If you mm -hmm. only did it during daytime hours, the, the, you know, it, it wouldn't be the success it is if it were more, uh, if more were required of the, the attendees. They, they really all, do make it easy for people. Well, it's also a good way to show that the library isn't so rules-based and, and can be flexible when the, the audience calls for it. Exactly, and the, the library is the center of this, but they're not the sole sponsor. Right. So once you've done all of this and you've really you know, done, done the hard work that goes into making this happen, it's really important to know and track the outcomes that you've, or, that you've helped achieve. This is a vital factor in making your service sustainable rather than making it just an add-on nicety. If you're going to demonstrate the return on investment in library services, and specifically about services to entrepreneurs, then you have to know how your work turned out. Now, I know this goes against 100 years of library tradition to actually care about what somebody does with the information once they get it in their hot little hands. But it's really important to have this so that you can share this beyond the immediate uh, relationship of the individual and the, and, the, and the librarian. Not that you're going to, you know, trumpet the specifics, but the fact that you've helped build business in the community, that you've helped the entrepreneurs, and that there are specific instances to which you can point are really important. And if you've developed strong relationships with these entrepreneurs, they're going to be more than happy to share their success stories, not only with you, but with the rest of the community. Also, I think when the, the marker for something's value is its utility and its pragmatic application to a specific problem. Following up with somebody and saying, okay, so we gave you the stuff we've pulled together on getting a business license. How did it work for you? Would anything else have been helpful? Could we strengthen this product? Mm -hmm. So that you right. can learn from their experience and that they get both the message that you want to improve and you are able to make the improvements. 
Um, we don't always follow up because uh, a lot of what we do we don't think of as applied. But in this case, just going back and saying, did it help you solve your problem? And is there something else that would have made that even better? Is an important part of maintaining the relationship and of really doing work that makes a difference to these people. So if you only take away one message from this whole program, take this one away. This is a long-term relationship with a client. This is not a one-off transaction like so much of what we do, especially in adult services and libraries. You need to allow people to choose to stay in, to be part of this conversation. Uh, it's important to keep the mailing list up to date. It, it's, it can be really tough and it can be really lonely if you're an entrepreneur, <laughs> if you're used to working in a more traditional environment. And having that ability to stay in touch with people who care and who've been willing to give you a hand along the way is really important. I, 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 this so totally happened to me. I'd been working in a library my whole life, right? I've been working in a library. I, the, the library I worked in had more than 200 employees that I saw every day. And the next thing I know, I'm a work-at-home solo entrepreneur. And the reason this slide's on the screen right now is that I sat at my desk and cried for like two weeks until I bonded with the UPS guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just needed somebody in my day that, that knew I was there and knew I was working and, you know, some kind of human connection. And having all the resources is one thing, but having the relationships is a big part of of people who work alone, staying sane when they do it and feeling good about continuing to work hard and try to make something happen. Just some person who cares whether it turns out and notices if you showed up today um, really can be a help. So don't worry, worry less about your databases and, and more about your connections, and I think you'll be on the right track to serve this group. So stay in touch with your uh, entrepreneurial community and stay in touch with us. We, have, we appreciate your time today. Please remember to fill out the evaluation that will come up on your screen when, the, uh, the, when this uh, webinar is over, and thank you for listening. And thanks to um, Stanley Strauss and uh, Chuck and Eileen O'Shea for doing the technical side of the work that makes these possible. Thanks, everybody, for attending.